Welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, Catherine, I think we still have the slide on. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So um, welcome all and thank you to the invisible Catherine Henshaw, um, who's done tremendous work to, to prepare this uh, webinar. And thank you all, uh, here I am. Thank you all for joining us today. We have um, a very large group of attendees, sign of the uh, urgency of the topic that we will be talking about today. My name is Janet Kohl. I'm co-director of UCR's Center for Ideas and Society, and I welcome you to a special forum on the war in Ukraine, an event of um, unfortunately historical dimensions that is currently shaking our societies to their very foundations. I also wanted to draw your attention to a second event on the war in Ukraine organized by the Center. Uh, the title is Uncommon Emergency, a roundtable on the invasion of Ukraine, border violence, war, and unshared suffering, uh, moderated by my co-director Dylan Rodriguez. That will happen on March 9th, and Catherine will share a link with you. I'm uh, extremely grateful to our four panelists, which you see here, who joined us today and who did not hesitate a moment to make time in their busy schedules and on very short notice. So thank you for being here and for your willingness to share your expertise and your rich experience with us. Uh, let me say a couple of things real quick about how this works today. Um, so after my short introduction, our panelists will present individual statements of um, about five minutes each introducing us to important historical, political, economical, and cultural uh, facts about the fraught relations between Ukraine and Russia from their perspectives. Uh, this will be followed by a conversation between the panelists of roughly 20 minutes and at around 1.50, I will open the discussion to um, your questions so that we have roughly 40 minutes for the Q&A, which is a little longer than normal, but um, uh, I think we need that time. So please feed your questions into the webinar Q&A as they occur to you, and you can also vote up other questions. Um, you, the meeting will be recorded and closed captioning is available through your Zoom menu. So before I introduce the panelists, I would also like to acknowledge that what we're doing today here takes place on the traditional homelands of the Kawiya, Tongva, Luisenyu, and Serrano peoples and express our gratitude for the opportunity of living and working on their lands. As you see, we have four panelists today and I will introduce them briefly to you now. Paul Danieri is Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at UCR. His research examines international politics in the post-Soviet region, focusing on Ukraine and Russia. His book, and when, when you hear the title, uh, uh, when I heard it, I thought Paul must have had a premonition. Ukraine and Russia from Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War, published with Cambridge University Press in 2019, a book that traces the roots of um, the current conflict uh, to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. His most recent book is Ukraine's Outpost, Dnipropetrovsk and the Russian-Ukrainian War of 2022. Uh, co-edited book, and then there are two other publications, book publications, The Sources of Russia's Great Power Politics, Ukraine and the Challenge to the European Order of 2018, and Understanding Ukrainian Politics of 2007. Our second panelist is Jana Gretasova. She's an Associate Professor of Political Science and a cooperating faculty in the Economics Department. She received her PhD in government from Cornell and a PhD in economics from the University of Economics in Bratislava in Slovakia. She held previous appointments at Berkeley, Stanford, Johns Hopkins and Georgetown University. Jana has also worked at the uh, European Commission in Brussels and the National Bank of Slovakia. Her many publications focus on the political economy of privatization and reforms in Eastern Europe, on global banking, political perceptions of monetary policy and the role of non-market coordination in financial system development. And she's currently writing a book exploring um, the independent central, central banks in an age of populism, rising inflation and wealth inequality. 
Georg Michels, a fellow German, is a professor of early Russian, Ukrainian, and Hungarian history in our history department, trained at Harvard's, you know, Harvard University's Ukrainian Research Institute. He's particularly interested in the fluidity of the Russian, Habsburg, and Ottoman imperial borderlands. And he just published uh, a beautiful book, Habsburg Empire Under Siege, Ottoman Expansion and Hungarian Revolt in the Age of Grand Vizier Ahmed Koprulu, 1661 to 76 with McGill Press in 21. And last but not least, Kirill Tomov is Professor of History and Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities at UCR. His research interests include the intersection of musical life and Russian history, as well as 20th century world history, transnational cultural exchange, and the Cold War. He's author of numerous articles and two books, Virtuosi Abroad, music, Soviet Music and Imperial Competition during the early Cold War uh, with Cornell in 2015, and Creative Union, the professional organization of Soviet composers 1939 to 53. Kirill has also been the director of the University of California's Moscow Study Center in the early 2000s, a Fulbright Fellow and a Senior Fellow at Harvard's Davis Center. His current research project is entitled Dominant Chords, Music and Soviet Cultural Empire 1945 to 58. So what brings us together here today? Since last week we've we find ourselves in an extremely perilous and, and fragile geopolitical situation with a brutal war of territorial conquest and the cost of civilian lives in Ukraine, a democratic state with borders to several NATO countries. The humanitarian catastrophe is already there with over a million people fleeing or having fled from their war-torn country. As of last week, Vladimir Putin has placed Russian nuclear deterrent forces on high alert so the threat of a nuclear strike appears all of a sudden uh, quite real, real to a degree, a thought that I had hoped I'd never have to entertain uh, during my lifetime. Despite a past decade um, characterized by the crisis of democracies and increasing boldness of autocratic rulers, the world stands surprisingly united. And I would like to say that if there is a silver lining to this world war, then it is that. Pushing Russia into a corner through economic sanctions and both financial and moral pressure in, in some very interesting dynamics. The world is in a state of shock, and yet Western nations have reacted quite swiftly and effectively. There's a huge wave of international, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see really, a huge wave of international solidarity with Ukraine, 100,000 people gathering uh, in uh, Berlin alone last weekend. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Zelensky is cast in the unlikely role of a hero, tirelessly at work to defend his people and his country, and present around the clock on social media channels, uh, has become a master of the direct appeal. Putin, in contrast, appears as the Machiavellian monster, spinning out of control an anachronism in his autocratic hypermasculinity. And I'm glad that we have such profound expertise here at UCR with our four internationally renowned experts who will now discuss the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which has been going on uh, in various forms for a very long time and how that could escalate with such force. How could this happen? Uh, why does Putin take such a gamble and why now? What are the historical reasons behind Russia's claim to Ukrainian territory? Which economic and political interests are involved? How do Ukrainian and Russian cultures differ? And what do they share? What do they have in common? And what can be done possibly to prevent further escalation into, um, horrible to think of it, a global war? Let me start this discussion by asking each of the four panelists a question for which they have prepared um, short statements. And I'm starting with Paul Danieri. Paul, as one of the uh, leading experts in the US on Ukrainian-Russian uh, politics, did you see this coming? Did you believe there would be a war as we see it now? And what are some of the key uh, issues in this complex, in the dynamics between those two countries? Thanks, Jeanette, and thanks, Catherine, and, and thank all of you for, for being with us. Uh, an incredibly sad but important topic. 
Um, I did not see this coming, this war. Uh, but I've, I've been writing about this for a long time and I've been saying for a long time, um, Russia, has, Russia does not accept that Ukraine is an independent country. Of course, it's a huge generalization. Um, but going all the way back to when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia said, this is okay, but Ukraine, Russia, Belarus have to be together. And that was true uh, before Putin was president. And I should say it was true before NATO was really talking seriously about enlargement. So this is not really a response to NATO enlargement, although that certainly has irked Putin because Russia's demands on Ukraine predated NATO enlargement. Um, the reason um, I didn't expect it to, to happen now is because it's so cataclysmic. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think Putin would do this, but here I think is the explanation, and, and this I did see, which is after 2014, when Russia uh, seized a, a couple of good chunks of Ukrainian territory, this was a strategy on Putin's part to get the Ukrainian government to come to terms, right? We've got this territory of yours. We are running this low level conflict on your Eastern border. If you want it to stop, you've got to come to terms with us. And the Ukrainians um, over the last eight years had shown that they weren't going to knuckle under. And so I think the strategy that Putin thought was going to work, a sort of small war strategy of 2014 uh, has proven not to work. And, and so in 2022, he's decided that, um, you know, he, that he's going to go this route. So over the 20 years, it's been economic pressure, political pressure, um, haranguing various countries, then a small war, and now uh, a big war. But I have to say, um, I didn't think it would happen. Uh, I wrote a paper last year in which I said uh, the nature of these Minsk agreements is that they're not going to lead anywhere. And so the only way the, the deadlock will be broken is if Russia either uh, reduces its demands or goes all in. And I didn't think it was going to go all in. I didn't think it was going to reduce its demands either. I thought what Russia would do would be simply play it out into the future and wait for better circumstances. And it seems that what has happened is that in Putin's mind, maybe playing it out into the future started to look like a bad strategy. Like many wars, I think this one begins with someone thinking, a window of opportunity is closing. Ukraine is slipping away. If I don't do something now, it's going to be much harder to do a year from now or two years from now or five years from now. As far as the key issues in the power dynamics between the two countries, it's simply this idea that um, Russia, Russian elite, Putin in particular, um, does not see Ukraine as an, in, as an independent country and sees what the, the separation of Ukraine from Russia, not only as an historical disaster, but one that is maintained by an historical enemy. He sees the fact that Ukraine has not come back to the Russian fold as largely a result of Western plotting and particularly plotting by the United States, which I think is nuts, um, but I think that's what Putin believes. I'll stop there. Thank you, Paul. We'll uh, come back um, to that a little later. Let me uh, move on uh, and ask uh, Georg uh, a oh. question. Um, you brought a PowerPoint, Georg, right? Yes, so, I, I will show some maps and images. Yeah, so as a medieval historian of, of Eastern Europe and Russia, what, what can you tell us about the, the history, the long shared history of Russia and Ukraine, and why is Ukraine so uh, important to Putin and I guess to many Russians as well. Okay. The current war has been preceded by a conflict over history and historical memory. Russian historians have provided much of the ammunition for Putin's propaganda war to deny the existence of the Ukrainian state and nation. And vice versa, Ukrainian historians have provided the legitimacy for the existence of an independent state and nation. One of the hottest conflicts has been over the medieval state of Rus, which you see on this map and its historical legacy. The state was founded in the eighth century by Vikings to control trade routes that connected Scandinavia with the Byzantine empire and the Middle East. The capital of this Viking state was Kiev. In the year 988, the ruler of Kievan Rus, the Viking prince Voldemar converted to Eastern Orthodoxy on Crimea, not insignificant, and adopted the Christian name Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. He later was made a saint 
for this act. So here, the Scandinavian Vikings were moving very quickly on their long boats along the rivers, including the, the Dnieper to the Black Sea, then to Byzantium, North Africa, and, uh, the, uh, and, and Lebanon, and so on. According to the now dominant Russian view, Vladimir was the founding father of the first Russian state and the Russian Orthodox Church. Church and state formed a productive symbiosis and Kiev became the cradle of Russian civilization. The destruction of Rus by the Mongols in the 13th century was a world historical tragedy, but the legacy of Rus survived in Moscow, where the descendants of Vladimir established a second Russian state, the core of the future Russian empire. Putin considers Vladimir, quote, the savior of Russia and has promoted the cult of Vladimir. To him, Kiev and Crimea, where Vladimir was baptized, are, quote, sacred Russian lands. A last statue of Vladimir now stands next to the Kremlin. During the unveiling ceremony, which you see on this picture, on Russian Unity Day on November 4th, 2016, Putin told a large crowd, quote, Vladimir the Great has laid the moral foundations on which the lives of us Russians are still based today. He has given our ancestors a strong moral bearing, a sense of solidarity, and the unity which helped them win military victories for the glory of our fatherland, making it stronger and greater with each generation. Here is Putin on that day with the patriarch, patriarch Kirill, of the Russian leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. Here is St. Vladimir presiding over the Kremlin. And here is Putin kissing an icon of um, St. Vladimir in Kiev in 2013. Um, I come, can come back to that later. What, his last visit incidentally to Kiev. There's clearly no space for Ukraine or Ukrainians in this interpretation of Kievan Rus. The Ukrainian view of Kievan Rus is very different. Vladimir or Volodymyr, Volodymyr Zelensky, as Ukrainians call him, has no intention of building a sacred Orthodox state. Rather, he built a secular state that was integrated with Europe through dynastic marriages, trade, code of laws, and democratic institutions. Volodymyr presided over a multi-ethnic society. Kiev was a cosmopolitan place with Catholic Poles, Jewish Khazars, Muslim Persians, Armenians, and other Eurasian peoples mixed with the indigenous East Slavic population, the ancestors of the later Ukrainians, Russians, and white Russians. Volodymyr was tolerant, open to the world, and internationally respected. His legacy served as a powerful inspiration for a stateless Ukrainian people for centuries to come. The historian Mikhailo Khrushchevsky, who, who wrote extensively about Volodymyr and without any doubt, the greatest Ukrainian historian that ever lived, became the first president of independent Ukraine in January, 1918. And Omelyak Pritsak, the leading expert on Kievan Rus, was the founder of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and later instrumental in establishing the Institute of Ukrainian History in Kiev. We are thus dealing with two diametrically different interpretations of the Kievan state and its legacy. The Ukrainian version is much closer to the truth. The Russian version provides a justification for the destruction of independent Ukraine. In case you haven't seen enough of Putin kissing Vladimir, so take it off. I think we have. Thank you. Um, thank you, Georg. It's interesting to see that um, the, the tremendous role of um, religion, religious yes. cult, the strength of the myth of origin, uh, not only in this um, culture. Um, I would like to move on to Jana, um, our expert in um, economics and um, ask her uh, if she could introduce us briefly to some um, economic cornerstones and uh, what effect the sanctions of the West, the Western world are likely to have on both Russia and our global 
financial system, Jana. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Catherine and the Center for organizing this event. And thank you, everybody, for attending it. Uh, I will share um, and I will show you some slides. Uh, it's always easier to um, explain issues like finance using data and figures. So, okay. So just um, let me start with a preface that um, the situation is evolving fast, uh, and so. Some of the facts that I will be presenting today uh, may, be, may be already outdated. Uh, and uh, I will also focus only on the uh, recent uh, financial uh, sanctions, which were the most consequential and probably uh, unprecedented. So one of the most severe sanctions was that the Central Bank of Russia was prevented from accessing its reserves uh, denominated in euros and dollars. Uh, here on the right, you have a figure showing uh, Russia's currency reserves, um, which are held by various countries, Germany, Japan, France, um, China. A part of reserves uh, is also in gold and, um, and in cash. So roughly half of Russia's uh, $640 billion reserves um, had effectively been frozen. And uh, now what are these production reserves? Uh, the most obvious um, way to think of reserves is as a national strategic buffer. So when um, Russia's financial system and currency um, comes uh, under pressure, then dollars or euros um, from uh, these reserves can be sold for rubles, and the Central Bank of Russia can prop up uh, the value of the domestic currency and slow its depreciation. And this will provide relief to importers and to consumers. But as we see here on the Central Bank of Russia, it's now uh, unable to access uh, these reserves, which are denominated in foreign currencies. The second consequential sanction was the disconnection of uh, some Russian banks, and we can talk about which ones and uh, which ones were not disconnected from the SWIFT global uh, financial messaging system. So it's, the SWIFT is basically a communication platform uh, that connects 11,000 banks around the world and enables them to make fast and secure cross-border payments. Uh, you probably read that Russia, uh, since 2014, started to develop their own uh, communication system or alternative platform uh, called SPFS, uh, um, which is used by roughly 400 Russian banks. And so 400 Russian banks can communicate using this system, but only a few foreign banks uh, are involved. And so because this system is just for intra-country communication, it's quite useless for uh, to Russian banks. And there were other um, uh, financial sanctions such as asset freezes and, and then travel bans directed and, at Russia's financial oligarchs and political uh, officials and members of Putin's inner uh, circle. What, what was striking about these um, uh, sanctions uh, was that uh, not only they were unprecedented, uh, particularly um, sanctions on the Central Bank of Russia, because this is a major step not easily taken against a central bank as important and as, as closely uh, integrated uh, with the Western networks as the Central Bank of Russia, but also that these sanctions um, uh, kind of represented uh, unprecedented um, multilateral coordination. So even countries like Switzerland, which is traditionally has been a neutral joint of um, the EU and the EUS in sanctioning Russia. So what are the present, what are the um, kind of the, the present the short term effects of the sanctions? I would like to focus on a couple. So you probably noticed that the value of the of the of the Russian ruble uh, has plummeted. Uh, it lost uh, nearly 30% of its value and um, 
the ruble is uh, now worth less than a penny. And so the weaker currency, as you know, will um, increase the price of imports and will increase inflation. Russian inflation is predicted uh, to reach over 13%, but these are just uh, um, you know, current predictions, which will obviously change. And uh, as a way to respond to this uh, collapse of ruble, the Russian Central Bank um, more than doubled the country's key interest rate from 9.5 to 20%. And so, and this was obviously also increased the price um, of borrowing for businesses and consumers, for example, mortgage rates offered uh, by some banks, like the, the second largest um, Russian bank, um, VTB, um, have increased to 15, over 15%. Uh, in, in the context of the of the Russia of the ruble's depreciation, uh, we should not forget that Russia has over seven hundred um, million dollars worth of government bond payments, uh, which are due this month. And um, and we also, you know, probably um, seen that the major credit rating agencies uh, downgraded uh, Russia's bonds to junk status um, below the investment rate which means that it would be much more difficult for Russia to borrow and to repay its debt. And so we may see uh, potentially uh, Russia defaulting, defaulting on its uh, hard currency debt. And Russia, as you know, is currently the 12th largest economy in the world. And when it defaulted last uh, on its debt in 1998, this led to serious banking crisis, uh, financial crisis, which spread overseas. And finally, um, uh, you know, as you know, Russia's stock market uh, remains uh, closed, at least until March 5th. Uh, but as the war continues uh, in Ukraine, uh, energy uh, and food uh, markets face um, substantial shocks. Global commodity prices uh, soared 50%, which was the fastest pace in 27 years. And I will focus on two commodities here, oil and, and wheat. Um, so the price of oil um, surged past $112 per barrel. As we know, Russia is the world's third largest producer of oil, following the US and Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, you know, over half of the uh, Russia's exports um, are Oh, so most of oil, most, most of Russia's exports are oil and petroleum products and gas, and half of these uh, exports go to the U.S. Um, and uh, in addition to oil prices, uh, the, the price of wheat has increased substantially, uh, and this is consequential because Russia and Ukraine are the biggest wheat and grain exporters, and any hit uh, to or crops or exports of wheat uh, would be reflected in a higher prices for many emerging market economies, partic particularly countries in Africa, where food accounts for a large portion of their uh, CPA baskets. And so in countries like Egypt, for example, uh, Egypt is heavily dependent on uh, imports of wheat from Russia. Prices of um, uh, wheat are subsidized by the government just to prevent uh, political instability. So. Uh, we may see some uh, problems in other parts of the world because of the increasing uh, price of wheat. Um, and these increasing prices of commodities uh, increase also fear of inflation, uh, which could be a source of, um, as I said, political instability worldwide. Um, inflation uh, will slow growth. So we may be again in the situation of stagflation, like in 1980s. Uh, which is very problematic because it's not clear how global central banks can respond to the situation, given uh, that they are already in kind of accommodative position vis-a-vis -vis inflation. And so I, 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 I stop with um, uh, a couple of questions. The next question is, is this enough to stop Putin or can additional sanctions be introduced? And uh, can isolation and economic sanctions um, bring about political change, uh, as it was the case uh, with um, previously with rock states and area states? 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jana. And I think we'll come back to the kind of dual uh, question as to uh, for how long can Russia survive this and uh, what price do we pay on the other end? Um, I uh, do have a question for uh, Kirill. Um, so Putin has made quite specific claims about the 20th century history of Ukraine and tried to associate its leadership with fascism. As a historian of the Soviet Union, can you provide us with some historical context um, that might help us understand a little better why he makes these claims? Yes, th thank you, Jeanette and Catherine, first of all, for, um, for organizing this. Thank you to uh, Paul, Jana, and Georg for, uh, for, for participating. And thank you all um, who are here um, to, to join in for, for coming. Um, so yeah, Putin's justification for the invasion was filled with uh, profound historical distortions, the, the sort of cornerstones of which um, Georg has already um, sort of outlined. But I think, and I think it might be easy to dismiss those distortions as sort of unhinged ravings um, because they're so distorted. But I also think that they are revealing. Um, one of Putin's claims is that we have Lenin to thank for the very existence of Ukraine. Okay, this of course simply isn't true, um, but it has its roots in the very early immediate post-revolutionary period of Soviet history. So remember that the Bolsheviks were Marxist revolutionaries who believed that class was the most important division in society. And at the time of the revolution, most of them considered nationalism to be a sort of form of false consciousness in service of the bourgeoisie and a distraction from more important, more revolutionary, um, especially proletarian class consciousness. But Lenin was a pragmatist as well as a Marxist, and he observed both in the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and in the mobilization of significant segments of the population in the Russian Empire during the Russian Civil War that national identity and the national aspirations that were inherent in nationalism could be a, a really powerful mobilizing tool. So Lenin and the architects of early Soviet nationalities policy essentially sought to co-opt that tool, nationalism, and harness it to the service of the revolution. Uh, Putin is not wrong that in some places the Bolsheviks set out to create nationalities where such focused identities uh, didn't yet exist. But he's profoundly wrong that one of those places was Ukraine. In fact, it was a vibrant and powerful nationalist mobilization in Ukraine, the creation of that independent uh, Ukrainian Republic in 1918 that Georg mentioned, um, both in Ukraine and there was a similar kind of mobilization in the Transcaucasus uh, regions of the, of the Russian Empire um, that most clearly demonstrated to the Bolsheviks the need to accommodate this nationalist sentiment. Um, so, and here's where I think the example is especially illustrative for the contemporary situation. Um, the Bolsheviks eventually thought that cultivating the outward forms of Ukrainian national expression, uh, the creation of a uh, Ukrainian national territory, the promotion of Ukrainian language, uh, the, the, the promotion of, of Ukrainian um, arts uh, in, in particular, um, and in, in the promotion of a, of a Ukrainian national political elite. Um, they thought that doing those things, providing the sort of trappings of national expression, would help project Soviet influence abroad, especially to a large Ukrainian minority in the new post-World War I state of Poland, which was in the process of constituting itself as a new nation state. So the idea was that Soviet Ukraine would be an appealing model to Polish Ukrainians um, who didn't have the same kinds of trappings of uh, national expression in, in Poland. Well, we don't have time, I don't think, to get into the details of exactly how and why this project failed, but it did fail um, with famously tragic consequences for the Ukrainian population. Uh, suffice it to say that by the late 1920s and early 1930s, the Bolsheviks in Moscow came to believe that the influence of national identity was actually flowing the other way across the Polish um, uh, Soviet border. Um, and they falsely attributed a widespread um, peasant opposition to their catastrophic um, collectivization policies, the collectivization of, of agriculture. Um, they interpreted that really widespread opposition to those policies, at least in part to Ukrainian nationalism. 
And so the result was an intensification of those already catastrophic collectivization policies and the resultant mass famine known in Ukraine as Holodomor. So how do these historical details of the early Soviet period relate to Putin's claims and provide a key, I think, to his motivations? I think the common thread to the original Soviet nationalities policy that Putin distorted in his Lenin gave us Ukraine, um, the national explanation of peasant opposition that led to Holodomor, and Putin's claim um, is the, the, the common thread through all three of those, is Ukraine as a model for the political possibilities in neighboring states. Putin and the other Russian nationalist elites around him, I think, fear the emergence of a democratically elected state with a functioning civil society in Ukraine, not because such a state poses a direct threat to Russia, but because of the example that its model poses for Russians who might unfavorably compare their own regime under his leadership with that model in Ukraine. So the threat is the example that the emergence of, I think Zelensky in particular um, poses. This is a threat that I think has been there um, since before, so all the way back to at least 2004, um, but it became especially acute uh, with the election of Zelensky and his, um, his at least election on a platform of, of anti-corruption. Um, that brings me to the second part of the question, uh, and that is Putin's absurd claim that Zelensky is a fascist. Um, there are so many grounds on which this absurdity can be refuted that it, it might be better simply to dismiss it this time as unhinged raving. But like even the most outrageous conspiracy theories, there's often a, a, a little kernel that connects the absurd to the real world that the rest of us inhabit. Uh, in this case, that kernel is related both to the continuing story of Soviet Ukraine um, under Stalin and to the mass protests in late 2013 and early 2014 that drove the last pro-Russian president of Ukraine out of the country, posited Ukraine as a bastion of the West on Russia's doorstep, and prompted the illegal occupation of Crimea and the illegitimate referendum that de facto annexed Crimea to Russia. Um, and of course, the formation of the breakaway regions in Donbass, that little war strategy that, that Paul pointed to. So let me continue the story by backing up again to the uh, to the 1940s and especially to, to World War II. So during World War II, Ukraine and Belarus in particular were sites of some of the most horrific battles on the Eastern Front, the characteristically brutal Nazi occupation regime on the Eastern Front, and uh, mass atrocities uh, perpetrated by, by the Nazis. Uh, but near the end of the war, some Ukrainian nationalists who had collaborated with the Nazis in hopes of securing an independent Ukraine at war's end, uh, organized military units to fight against the Red Army, and especially against reincorporation into the Soviet Union, uh, and again, especially the new incorporation of Western territories of, of Ukraine, that part of Poland that had been uh, populated uh, with a large Ukrainian minority that, became, that was annexed as part of uh, Soviet territorial expansion at, at war's end. So this um, ultra-nationalist force was never large enough to slow the Soviet advance, and I don't think it had particularly strong hold on a Ukrainian population that had been uh, thoroughly brutalized by the Nazi occupation. But it did remain a challenge for the Soviets even after the war as they sought to incorporate these new Ukrainian territories, now Western Ukraine, uh, that they gained as part of the post-war settlement. So let's fast forward back to 2013-14. Uh, in those large and I think initially unorganized protests, there were some small splinter groups of the radical right in Ukraine. And you know, the Ukraine has a, a, a small radical right like that exists throughout uh, Europe. Um, those, uh, some splinter groups took their ultra-nationalist symbols and slogans from this um, World War II era collaborationist and nationalist resistance. Stripped of the World War II context, those symbols played a role in the iconography of the protests that was much larger than the actual ultranationalists in Ukraine's um, influence on the course of events or their appeal to the rest of the Ukrainian population. But at the time, Putin, uh, the Russian elite, and I think some pro-Russian Ukrainians, especially in East, uh, 
in the East seized on the prominence of those symbols to varying degrees to explain the whole Maidan movement as a revanche of ultranationalist right-wing strain of Ukrainian nationalism that could be shorthanded as fascist or even neo-Nazi. Ever since, I think Putin and his circle have used fascist or neo-Nazi as shorthand for the Western-facing leadership factions in Ukraine, even as the actual radical right in Ukraine has received almost no support in Ukrainian elections. I think there are, there are four Ukrainian ultranationalist parties, and they have a total combined of one seat in yeah. the Ukrainian parliament. I think this is a, a, a lower, lower um, representation of ultranationalists than in, in many um, Western European countries. Um, so nothing that I'm saying should suggest that the presence of those symbols in 2013 and 14 correlated to an actual strength. Um, but in Putin's imagination, and in the imagination of the Russian elite, elite that already thinks of, of Ukraine as, as not uh, legitimately existing, they're sort of conflated to those, those things. To, and, and that's where I think the, the, the sort of uh, completely, um, what seems like a completely crazy um, uh, label for, um, for the Ukrainian political elite comes from. As a not insignificant side note, every Soviet and Russian regime since World War II, including Putin's, has tried often successfully to use the myth of the war the of world war ii as a cornerstone for building their own legitimacy so i think the language of fighting against fascism is so deeply embedded in russian patriotic culture that it would actually be more surprising if it didn't surface during a military conflict than if it did even if it's uh, is is completely unhinged from even a common understanding of what actual fascism uh, actually is so with those two sort of historical notes coming out of the um, out of the, the Soviet history of Soviet Ukraine and its relationship to uh, to Russia, and I, I think the way that it might influence the way um, you know former KGB officer Putin uh, thinks about uh, the world, um, I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Carol, for this very detailed uh, account of um, you know the post-war um, backgrounds to um, to the. Uh, in, in many of our eyes, ridiculous uh, political claims and accusations that we're hearing at the moment. Um, this is a chance for the, um, the panel to react to one another if you want and um, respond to each of your statements. Georg, I see your hand. Yeah, I want to follow up with, uh, with uh, Kirill, the imaginations that's of a similar type, but uh, similarly crazy as, as I described them. Uh, talking about fascism, I think if fascism exists and it's in the Kremlin, I would compare um, uh, Putin to Milosevic, uh, mobilizing a mythological past to uh, destroy uh, people. Uh, Kosovo is uh, Kiev and Crimea. That is one reason why I don't think this war can be stopped by any rational means. Um, I have been reading uh, German historians' responses, uh, and also my students have often asked me, how come Putin calls the Ukrainian <laughs> Nazis? Now, again, as you said, there's a kernel of truth. If you think of uh, Stepan Bandera and the, and the Hilfspolizei, you know, Ukrainian policemen who were, were helping in Babi and other uh, operations, and also, of course, the pogroms that happened uh, in independent Ukraine against, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of Jews, but mostly killed by the Nikin and the White Army. Again, a kernel of truth, but what is forgotten, and I'm grateful to my German colleagues to point this out, is that many Ukrainians, hundreds of thousands, were worked to death as slave laborers yeah. in Germany, and more than four million German, uh, Ukrainians died in the fight against the German army in Ukraine. I, I I I agree with all that, and I think also that 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 the that the the the, the really brutal ger German occupation of Ukraine um, was uh, had the effect of you know after the mass famine of Holodomor there there was potentially fertile ground for anti-Soviet uh, sentiment in Ukraine. Um, the Nazi occupation I think uh, didn't entirely destroy that sentiment, but it sure um, obliterated a lot of it. Um, so the, the the yeah the, there's just there's no um, I think historical basis in thinking of Ukraine as fascist, um, but 
in the in Putin's imagination um, that uh, that just, I think still exists as something he has to do because of mobilizing the myth um, and something that he does do on the basis of some of the symbols deployed. Um, can I just uh, throw a, a follow up on on my answer to to pose a question to Paul, um, which is that that you you mentioned that you like like many wars I think you said this might be uh, one that comes as a as at least a partially a product of of someone seeing a window closing. Um, do you have a sense of what that window might be? Like what what did Putin see recently that? It's a good question. Um, because in some respects, I thought the window was still opening. In particular, in another year, this Nord Stream 2, the second big gas pipeline to Germany would be open, and it would be that much harder for the Europeans to put pressure um, on, on Russia. But I think there are two windows closing. Um, one of them is the biological one for Putin. And, and we don't know how he thinks about this, but we all, we all focus on birthdays that end in zero, and he turns 70 this year. And so I, I do wonder whether he thought um, I, there's a limited amount of time for me to his, complete what he's my historical mission. And I do think he thinks it's a historical mission um, to, to reunite Ukraine with Russia as he would have it. The other window that's closing gets into um, Ukrainian domestic politics. Um, and uh, Zelensky, this, uh, Zelensky was elected president uh, of Ukraine in 2019 with a pretty substantial majority. It was really a landslide. He's a 40 something, 41, I think at the time of his election, comedian um, with no prior experience in politics whatsoever. And his first language is Russian. Much of his media production and his media work uh, was, was produced in Russia. And I think Putin thought he's likely to be pro-Russian and he's a novice, I can roll this guy. Um, and it didn't happen. So, so it's sort of an expectation was dashed. Early in 2021, um, the Ukrainian government uh, arrested a guy named Viktor Medvedchuk. I wondered. Viktor Medvedchuk is a prominent Ukrainian oligarch and sort of the leading, he's basically seen as Putin's guy in Ukraine. So close that uh, Medvedchuk's daughter, Medvedchuk's daughter has Vladimir Putin as her godfather. Um, Medvedchuk and some others um, had bought media outlets through money that came from Russia and you know through shell companies, which was illegal. Medvedchuk was arrested on treason charges and put under house arrest and the media outlets were shut down. And, and so that's one respect in which the window was closing. Um, the other is, and I, and I fear that Western social science has done some damage here, is, is um, there's a lot of evidence that because of what happened in 2004, a lot of Ukrainians were um, ethnically re-identifying as Ukrainian rather than as mixed Ukrainian Russian. And this was uh, shown by a lot of survey data and very good survey research done by a lot of, uh, uh, um, well, Ukrainian, but also non-Ukrainian social scientists. And, and so there may again have been this sense in this other respect that um, Ukraine is moving towards Europe. Last thing I'll say is the European Union after 2014, the European Union and Ukraine did sign that association agreement, which was sort of the, the source of the dust up in 2013 in Ukraine in the first place. Yeah. Ukraine was integrating more and more um, with, with Western Europe. So there was a bunch of ways in which things maybe were just, I think, moving in the wrong direction for Putin. Yeah, thank you. But I, but I should say, but nothing that was like imminent, imminently disastrous, which is why I didn't think he would do this. So I'd like to continue this theme and maybe ask question, um, you know, maybe ask Paul and Kirill, maybe your, uh, a question about, um, you know, about this color revolution in 2014, uh, your maiden, and if, if you're made an, um, what, an, an kind of move of Ukraine towards democracy opposed some kind of existential threat uh, for Russia, right? So after that, uh, Putin right away invaded Crimea, invaded Donbass. Um, the West did not really stop him. The sanctions were more symbolic than anything else. And so, you know, this could have been some kind of, um, you know, impetus for Putin to continue to, to achieve his mission. Another argument that I heard recently was about the need of, I mean, we hear a lot about the need of expansion as one of the factors that prompted Putin. Um, but one argument that I heard, I think, by Gerard Roland from UC Berkeley was that, um, you know, that the error that the West committed was not to accept Ukraine into NATO. Um, 
So what do you guys think about that argument? So we need to talk a little bit about the Bucharest summit. In, um, in, in 2007, Putin went to the Munich Security uh, Summit, a Munich Security Conference. And he gave this, I think, historic speech of, of new belligerence, um, resentment at the United States, resentment at the West. A year later, uh, NATO was getting ready for its annual summit in Bucharest. And the Bush administration was pushing for NATO, uh, for Ukraine to be given what we call a map, a membership action plan, which basically sets out a pathway towards membership. Germany and, and France in particular, but others of the Europeans opposed this largely because they didn't want to alienate Russia. So the compromise they struck was that Ukraine will not be given a membership action plan uh, in Georgia as well, but will issue this statement that says someday they will be members. And, and I read this at the time, and actually uh, in my book, I, I quote a, a Russian leader at the time saying, uh, okay, you know, someday means effectively never. Right? I saw this as a, as a way of finessing the problem. Right? We'll tell the Ukrainians someday that they can be in, but what we're signaling to Russia is don't worry, it's not going to happen. That's not the way Putin interpreted it. And I think his interpretation, of course, was particular and strategic, um, which, which it, Ukraine ended up being in the worst of both worlds, which was it didn't have the, the guarantee uh, of, of NATO membership, but there was then this idea for Russia that there was a window that was going to close someday that if we don't get Ukraine before it gets admitted to NATO, um, it'll be too late. So in that respect, had we declared Ukraine a member of NATO in 2008 and extended it those guarantees, Ukraine might have been more secure. Yeah. What we also would have done is massively alienated Russia at a time when a lot of people still hoped uh, that that might not happen. May I? Thank you, Paul. Um, I see other hands up, but um, uh, in all fairness, I wanted to integrate some of the questions of our um, of, of our audience and uh, the attendees. And I was just, you know, and Paul, as uh, when you uh, uh, spoke about, uh, you know, Germany and the, the being Russian friendly, I was reminded of uh, um, a colleague of mine who, who told the story that he was invited to um, uh, you know, a, a fancy dinner um, with uh, the German uh, ambassador and he was seated next to a military attache uh, and half jokingly asked the guy when Germany would finally be ready to get, you know, to acquire some, uh, to have some weapons that could be used against Russia if need be. And the person, the attache stood up and said, Russia against Russia? Never. <laughs> so, um, and that was not so long ago. So that has changed yeah. quite can a bit. I, can I just very briefly follow up as a fellow German, uh, the unification of Germany has been mentioned repeatedly by Putin and by the Kremlin elite. And I don't think it's an entirely irrational argument mm -hmm. because during the negotiations with, between Kohl and Gorbachev, Kohl and with the support of Bush and others made the guarantee that NATO would not expand into the former territories of the Soviet Union, and and th and that document is documented. So in many ways, I understand when you look at a map of Soviet troops in Berlin until 1994 and where they are now, it's you know, this is they're 400 miles to the east now. So I can well, understand. I have why. to. Can I argue with Georg? Yes, go ahead. Um, I I read a lot of this stuff very briefly. Um, the the guarantee that was made was verbal. And, and it was about not expanding into the GDR, to the former territory of the, the DDR, the, Deutsche, the, the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. Because at that time in 1990, there was no notion that the Soviet Union was gonna collapse yeah. or that the former Soviet territories would even um, be on the table. So it's not as, even if a guarantee was made, it's not, uh, it's a, it was a much more limited um, guarantee in a period that, that kind of seemed irrelevant soon thereafter. I'm sorry, Jeanette. So I'm, I'm moving on to the questions because uh, there are many of them. Uh, and uh, the one um, is about the sanctions that are um, you know, currently happening. Are the sanctions providing to be an effective punishment for Putin? And if not, how resilient is the Russian Federation to economic penalties? So the question for how long can this go on? You know, what kind of effect is this? Is this going to have the effect that we want it to have? I suppose I um, I should answer this question. Uh, so you have obviously you have short term effects and long term effects. Uh, sanctions usually being thanked long term. We have some immediate impact of sanctions, as I mentioned, the collapse of ruble, uh, 
uh, and and obviously the confirmation that the dollar is still the king in the international financial system acting as safe haven. You have the collapse of some Russian banks, uh, for example, Sberbank, uh, the, the largest Russian bank, its European subsidiary, uh, it's bankrupt and um, and is it leaving from, from Europe. Uh, you have uh, some Russian firms also, um, their, their stocks, um, their, their stocks also lost, uh, you know, substantial value. Um, and so the financial functions, uh, particularly the ones targeting the central bank and the, the ability to use its foreign exchange reserves in euros and dollars uh, are quite effective, I think. But um, there will be another round of sanctions. I uh, I read this morning to be targeting um, maybe more Russian oligarchs, including more banks, or you know penalizing more banks because now only um, selecting selected banks uh, are disconnected from the SWIFT, uh, but there may be more banks added. But um, so but the predictions are that Russia will experience substantial collapse in, in, in its economic output. Uh, some predict, you know, double digit contraction of Russia's economy. And some, you know, some obviously predict that banking crisis and, 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 and the currency crisis uh, can lead to similar uh, situation and maybe hyperinflation similar situation that Russia experienced uh, in the early 1990s after the collapse of communism. And you know there are there are several. I mean, I don't know if you want me to elaborate on um, <laughs> uh, what are kind of preconditions. So obviously, everything will depend uh, on if Russia will be able to export, because mm -hmm. Russia, given the fact that um, its reserves, uh, half of its reserves um, is frozen, is dependent on revenues from exports, right? So as soon as Russia, you know, so as soon as Russia, Russia is able to get extra revenues, you know, it can use these revenues to finance imports and can, and can withstand sanctions for a long period of time. It also depends if Russia is able to sell its gold, who is going to buy its gold, if it's able to switch to cryptocurrency, right? And, but, you know, we can elaborate on this later. Or if, if you know, Chinese banks or maybe other banks um, will be willing to join the Russian alternative to the SWIFT system. Right, so all these questions which are not answered now, uh, which will determine how long can Russia withstand sanctions, the current sanctions. But I, what I'm saying, there, there will be new sanctions, um, and uh, we, we, you know, we can't really predict uh, with precision how these will be affecting um, Russia and the world economy as well um, in the future. I'm Thank just going to add one thing yes. real, real quickly, which is um, on top of all that, um, war is very, very expensive. Um, to the extent that this war drags on or that Russia gets uh, dragged into a long-term uh, counterinsurgency operation in Ukraine, um, that will be a further significant drain uh, on, the, on the Russian budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question by a PhD student at UCR uh, who says, I'm a Ukrainian from Moldova. Is it? How do you pronounce it? I'm sorry. I have my Moldova, Moldova, yeah. my German in my head. In the light of recent events, what is the best option for Moldova now? How can it protect itself best? Because based on Putin's essay he published in uh, July of 2021 on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, in Putin's mind, not only Ukraine, but also Moldova has no right to exist as an independent nation. And I guess one could, and this is my uh, taking this a little further, one could add the Baltic states. So um, where is this going to lead, really? Um, yeah. Well, I don't know if one of the historians wants to address this, but in a way, the model got started in Moldova, when in uh, 1991, as the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, um, uh, people in, in the Transnistria portion of Moldova, basically uh, ethnic Russians and Ukrainians, said, we don't want to be part of Moldova, we want to stay with the Soviet Union, um, and sort of based around a, a giant Soviet army base there, uh, where the Russian 14th Army was stationed, sort of carved out a little separatist republic within Moldova, which exists to this day. Um, and, and so Moldova is in a perilous situation because, because one of the potential war aims, and we already see this on the map of the conflict, is for Russia to try to essentially 
uh, stretch control of the Black Sea coast all the way across from uh, no, uh, um, you know, from from. Uh, uh, boy, I'm forgetting the name of the Russian city, but all the way across uh, westwards uh, through Crimea, through Odessa in Ukraine, and all the way uh, to the Danube River Delta, um, which would then put Russia much closer to that uh, part of uh, Moldova, which it already sort of effectively controls. And so, yeah, it would be a threat to a much larger military threat to Moldova than currently exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question, there are some who say that Putin would never have done this under Trump, implying that Putin sees Bi Biden as weak. Um, to what extent, if it is, is this notion true? How has Russian geopolitical calculus changed while under Biden uh, and Trump? I'm going to take that one too, and then at least initially, because uh, my friend and colleague Jessica Pisano wrote up uh, an essay for Politico yesterday, which I would urge you to read. Um, and, and she lays out, I think, a quite compelling argument, uh, basically saying, if uh, Trump were president, this may not have happened because Putin wouldn't have needed a war to do this under Trump. Um, that basically with Trump, he was kind of getting what he wanted. So, so her argument was, it wasn't that Trump was going to deter this, it was that Trump was, would, have, would have supported it and it probably would have happened, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Can I just... Um comment very briefly on the naivete of the West, whether it's under Trump or even now. What we saw in Chechnya 20 years ago, and I wished we had had a symposium on Chechnya, the mm -hmm. genocide that followed. Putin yeah. came to office to take care of the Chechen problem and moved into Chechnya, killing tens of thousands, both Russians and Chechens, and establishing a terror regime, which still exists today, the West looked the other way, largely because of September 11th. I was not shocked by what's happening. It's unbelievably atrocious. I cannot bear it, but I've seen this before in Chechnya. And three of my Chechen friends have disappeared without a trace. So this has hit home to me 20 years ago, very personally, and I am not surprised and no nothing will stop Putin. I was hoping perhaps the Russian Orthodox Church, but it's selling out. Just to, to, to follow up on Georg, um, it, this is one of the things that I find most terrifying about the sort of continuing developments in Ukraine, is that we have seen a consistent pattern of Russian military engagement that escalates ultimately to the, the complete destruction of, of urban cities and the populations that inhabit them. Um, and Grozny in, in Chechnya was the model for that, but we've, but we've seen it in other uh, Russian actions since. And this is my sort of greatest fear for what could be coming in, in Ukraine. Um, and we haven't seen it yet, but we're starting to see the beginnings of it, uh, of the possibility of it. So it, it's a um the, the the question of whether well i'll stop there yeah well I, this, I, this is what my friends uh and former students who are you know specialists on the russian military are predicting yeah and how yeah. long are we in the west going to tolerate this well, in in hungary in 56 we allowed the massacre of the ukrainian oh, sorry of the hungarian uh quote-unquote liberation fighters in the streets of budapest are we allowing this in Kiev, and it's on a larger scale than Budapest because it's also in Kharkiv, yeah. in Chernihiv, possibly in Lviv. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask at the beginning, well, what's the difference to to um, to Hungary in '56 and uh, to Pro the Prague Spring in uh, uh, in the in '68? Um, but to me, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert, but I, I seem to see a pattern that Putin always tests how far he can go, how far he can push things with Georgia, with Chechnya, with the Maidan and the revolution of dignity in 2014, with Crimea, with Donbass. It, it, it's, it goes on and on. And this is what worries me. I think a, a big difference between uh, the 56, 68 and the, and the present um, is, the, is and in a sense, what limited 
the immediate impact of the the in the suppression of the Hungarian Revolu revolution in 56 and the occupation of, of um, Czechoslovakia in 68 is the existence of a very large um, group of Hungarians in the one case, uh, Czech, Czech Slovaks in the other case, that were willing to accommodate and, and collaborate with, um, with the Soviet occupation. Um, and I think that that limited the, there, neither of them had the, had the same experience as Grozny, I'll put it that way. Um, I think it still remains to be seen what happens in Ukraine. We've seen no evidence that, um, you know, I think before 2014, this was, there was a large um, population of Ukrainians who were sympathetic to the Russian position and who, who looked towards Russia as um, not as a, not that they should be joining Russia, but that, but, but looked at Russia as a friend. I think one of the results of Putin's actions in 2014 in Crimea and in Donbas is the is the dissolution of that um, sentiment in Ukraine. I mean, if he thought that he was he was undermining Ukrainian identity and that he did the exact opposite, and he's doing exactly the opposite of what he intends now, driving Ukraine even further into 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 Europe, um, and so. I don't know if that, I think in 2014, there might have been that sort of, uh, you know, popular um, grounding for uh, a Russian presence. It doesn't seem to be there now. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, I have two uh, questions that are kind of uh, the different sides of the same coin, I guess. Uh, how long can Ukraine hold out until the situation gets, you know, unbearably dire? And on the other hand, how long can NATO or Europe as a whole stay united against Russia or will, you know, economic reasons prevent us from uh, staying firmly against this? Different Maybe I'll start with how long Ukraine uh, can hold out. Um, and, and of course, it's already under immense stress. Um, there's food shortages. Um, as the shellings of cities start, people are going to lose power. Um, it, you know, uh, it, it's going to it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I think the the crucial question is, um, to what extent can Ukraine and the Western allies maintain some lines of supply um, into the country to keep people fed and and uh, also then to keep them armed? Um, and, and we don't know. Uh, for example, we don't know whether whether Russia will will try to invade Kiev or, or uh, rubbleize it with artillery, which is, I think, what I would predict, or potentially just surround it and besiege it and just try to starve people out. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, how that will go. Um, but all of this, I guess, remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, just how long people can withstand it. Yeah. Georg? I, I, this talking about the destruction of Kiev, yes, in the outskirts, yes, but not in the center because the holy sites are there, the grave, of Vladimir and the other uh, Viking princes or Russian princes are there. The cave monastery is there. The holy sites to which uh, uh, Putin made a pilgrimage in 2013 will not be destroyed. They will be fought over hand by hand to hand. And I, I don't think uh, Putin will uh, stop before Ukraine is destroyed. The only way, and I hate to say this, and I wished I would not say this, and because I know it's so dangerous is if NATO gets involved because then we have World War III. Uh, but on the other hand, Fiona Hill, I recently read uh, uh, her commentary. She thinks we're already in World War III. Yeah. Can I add something on, 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 on this question? So just from economic point of view, uh, you know, as, as Paul mentioned that uh, Ukraine is facing some serious problems, food shortages, uh, but there also there is also optimism given this you know multilateral uh, assistance. For example, yesterday the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank issued joint statement promising more than five billion dollars in funding available for Ukraine. There is also and it's quite interesting that cryptocurrencies help as well because the a lot of a lot of aid to Ukraine is. Um, you know, it's in cryptocurrency, which can be in an exchange and used to buy food, etc., uh, etc. Et so there is an expression of solidarity in terms of the um, of the financial system uh, of Ukraine. Uh, central banks, you know, used in the past bilateral, um, uh, you know, swap lines 
to, to support, for example, um, Ukraine connection reserves so they can uh, help the domestic financial system, etc. So from the economic point of view, um, you know, there are some ways and, and there is this uh, uh, interest in, in, helping, uh, in helping Ukraine. It's worth yeah. pointing out that, I'm sorry, Carol, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, you know, in some respect, it's fascinating. We're already having the kind of conversation that was the conversation, you know, after six months or a year of World War One, which is not only about which battle, which, which um, armies can win on the battlefield, but which civilian populations um, can, can withstand what. And um, so on the one hand, you've got the Ukrainians trying to, to yeah. survive. On the other hand, you've got the average Russian who doesn't really, I think, see themselves as having a stake in this. Um, and how long will, 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 will they put up with it? Um, and I'll just say, because I saw my colleague Ben Bishan asked what I think is a really appropriate question, which is, even if the oligarchs or the Russian people get put under pressure, you know, how does that convert into Putin actually getting shoved out of power? And um, that's a very big and long question, but I think it's the right question to ask. Um, this ends either with, with World War III, as Georg said, or the annihilation of Ukraine, or when some group of the Russian security services, um, and they're the only ones who can do it, not the population without the people with guns, when some of them say, this is so horrible for Russia uh, that we have to put a stop to it. And the only way to, to put a stop to it is to, is to get rid of Putin. I'm not holding my breath waiting for that to happen, mm -hmm. um, but that is the pathway. Yeah. Yes. How, how can, does anyone uh, want to answer the question uh, as to how strong is is there, is there any support really in Russia for this war? And how strong is it, if so? Do we know anything about this? I mean, we see I, people taking to the street and being, yeah. you know, booked, but... I think it's a really hard question to ask and, and or to answer because I don't think we, we really know. Um, the, the Russian state media is still the way that, that I think a majority of Russians get their news. And according to that Russian state media, um, Russia is defending itself against a genocidal um, attack by Ukrainian fascists who are trying to um, destroy the Russian state. Um, and, you know, I don't think that, that I mean, the, the Russians I know are absolutely, um, uh, I don't know, I, I'm at a loss for words because this is extremely upsetting. Um, they, they do not um, support this at, at all. Um, how typical are they? Well, they're not typical. Um, the fact that that I know them makes them not typical. Um, and so what what does the average Russian on the street? Well, it depends which street. It depends, um, you know, are we talking about urban Russians? Are we talking about rural Russians? It's um, I, I think that it's I would be very surprised if a majority of Russians supported this in the way that we understand it in the West. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't think that that would be the case. Yeah. Um, but do they know what we know in the West? Many of them do not. There are a lot more sources of information that they get. So they know a lot more than, than, they, than they would have in the Soviet period, for example. Um, but does that translate to, I'm impressed with the number of people who are actually bravely taking to the streets in face of really strict um, anti-protest regulations and consequences for the people who are there, who are arrested there. I, I, I find that uh, sort of level of bravery of that minority of Russians who are taking to the streets to be a sign that there is not a lot of support for this. But can I be sure of that? I, I certainly cannot. Yeah, I, I just um, heard from a friend in Moscow. Uh, he says people are apathetic. They don't really care. I find that shocking, but perhaps understandable considering how brutal the regime clamps down on Russian, uh, um, you know, Protestant pr protesters. Uh, I just want to show one image, which is also typical for uh, what's happening today. And that's this, the collusion of the Russian Orthodox Church in the war. This is to the Russian Orthodox war, a, a kind of holy war a crusade talking about the craziness, this is very real. We all have experienced what Christian nationalism can do in this country, what it is doing. We're dealing with a similar phenomenon in Russia. And it's, more, it's perhaps even more militant because many of these clergymen and bishops see themselves, and the patriarch, see themselves in a apocalyptical struggle against the godless West. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out um, how this conflict is already changing Russia. You know, there's the question people ask me is, is, is Putin trying to reform the Soviet Union? 
And we think of that sort of as an, as an external territorial question. But there's important ways in which the Soviet Union is being reformed within, within Russia today, um, in particularly in terms of um, the, the media is getting that much more tightly clamped down. You know, they, they just um, closed uh, Echo Moskvi, the, the sort of long time, not, uh, not opposition, but, it, but not necessarily pro-Putin radio station, right? The, it's already changing from you have to, you can't be anti-Putin and be on the air to now you have to be pro-Putin pro to be on the air. And, and so the, um, this um, message and one of the questions referred to it that every school teacher in Russia apparently received instructions on a lesson to give to the students for basically teaching Putin's version of history and why this war is important. So this, um, that totality, right, begins to get you back towards the idea of a totalitarian society, um, a much deeper systematic central grip over the population. Um, that I just think it's worth, it's worth noticing how much this is changing Russia itself. Yeah, but held together by a very powerful ideology a Christian fashion. Absolutely. That is promoted by the patriarch Kirill. Yes. Many of you may remember how difficult it was for people to be gay in Russia. Yeah. And how, you know, basically they were denounced as 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 traitors. And and th that kind of apocalyptic language that you know uh, being homosexual or gay is a Western infiltration that destroys Russia, that language has taken over. Uh, and is, is, you know, it's very frightening. The masculinity politics of Putin um, are themselves another mammoth topic, but, and there is some really good research on this, including uh, some interesting stuff written by, by Jeanette. Um, but yeah, I don't think we have time to go into that, but we should be aware that a lot of what makes him popular in Russia and what he appeals to in Russia is this very traditional notion of masculinity. Uh, hence the bareback riding, the jet fighter flying, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And it sells. Yeah. So here's a, here's a big question that one would rather not ask, but someone asked it. I'm wondering how credible is Putin's nuclear threat? Yeah, this gets to my line of work again. Um, it's credible in the sense that, of course, they've got the hardware to do it with. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's a credible threat in the sense that certainly if he launches a nuclear weapon outside of Ukraine's borders, it probably means nuclear holocaust. Um, I've heard some people speculate if things go badly in Kiev, could he just use one on Kiev? I suppose I, my best, I don't think he will. I don't think he will need to. I don't think nuclear weapons are a useful weapon in this war. There's a massive literature on how um, nuclear weapons aren't really useful to do anything other than to deter the use of nuclear weapons. Um, and I think that's probably still the case. I also think if there were one thing that I think might get somebody in the general staff to say it's time to take this guy out, it would be that. It would be him ordering the button pushed. So I, I think it's a credible threat in the sense it's realistic. And he wants us thinking about it. He wants the West to think, do we really want to get involved in this? Do we really want to be resupplying Ukraine? Um, but I don't think it's a credible threat in the sense that it would be insane to actually do it. But I, I think Putin would do it if it needs to be done from his perspective. This is not, he's not a rational actor. Yeah, but I'm, I'm afraid he would. I, I think you may be right, but he can't push the button himself. Somebody, you know, orders have to go through multiple people before the, the button gets pushed. And, and the interesting question would be, would those orders be followed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, can, can I ask a question of, of Yana that has to do, I think, with uh, these, the, the, how, how can populations wait this out? Um, you know, the, the Ukrainians, the uh, uh, military assault on their territory, the Russians, um, uh, extremely deteriorating economic situation. Uh, and it has to do with, with one of the charts that you showed in your, in your five minutes. Um, I noticed that the, 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 Russian reserves denominated in dollars went in in 20 set between 2017 and 2018 there was a huge contraction in the amount of dollars that Russia had accumulated and it shifted elsewhere so the, my question is do you, why did that happen is is that preparation for this or is it, did something else happen there um and the and the other is combining that with what you told us about the alternative swift for for banks and the possibility of 
China joining. One of the the sort of theories that I've seen floated is that it was it might be a mistake to cut Russia off from SWIFT because that would be the uh, opportunity to create a non-dollar based alternative. Um, if those two things happen in tandem, might there be reserves Rus that Russia has and maybe in cooperation with China that would allow them to reduce the, ca the capacity of the sanctions to cripple the economy and therefore extend the Russian population's ability to endure the economic disasters. I don't know. It, 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 it's a, I'm asking you to speculate, I guess. But I also don't understand what happened in 2017-18, and this is the first I've known of that alternative SWIFT uh, for Russian banks. Well, so I don't want to speculate on what, you know, if, if Putin was preparing from 1718 and he would try to, and, and the central bank tried to somehow diversify its portfolio. Um, you know, obviously, all central banks, uh, you know, most, most of the uh, central bank uh, reserve assets are in dollars. So this is indeed quite interesting phenomenon that you, um, you, you exchange dollar again, other, uh, again, against other, other assets. Uh, in terms of in terms of the uh, China alternative SWIFT, I mean this this um, the Russian alternative uh, to SWIFT has started to be bail developed uh, from 2014. So you may say that from 2014, Putin started to prepare for the war. Um, and uh, but I would be very surprised if Chinese banks, um, you know, try to avoid sanctions by joining Russia. Uh, in uh, its use of its domestic uh, communication system, um, you know, because obviously banks and in, even in other ways how to evade uh, sanctions, for example, in helping Russia to sell gold, to buy gold, for example, right? Because, I mean, it could be a good deal because, you know, could maybe Russia, you know, Chinese can buy gold for lower prices or, or in some way, in, on some way, you know, help them to deal with cryptocurrencies because there is a fear of sanctions, right? So um, financial institutions uh, that are somehow trying to avoid sanctions may be uh, imposed penalties. And we have the case, for example, of, of a French uh, bank, Bente Paribas, who, you know, which paid quite substantial penalty when it tried to avoid sanctions, previous sanctions on Russia imposed by the US and, uh, and the European Union. So uh, I think, uh, you know, even with cryptocurrencies, you know, if you accumulate your reserves in cryptocurrencies or exchange reserves in, in the cryptocurrencies, you need at some point to exchange them against a real currency to buy food and to buy real products, right? So you need, a, you know, a banking transaction, right? And so this would involve, again, um, you know, some kind of actor and, and a real currency and could be on the radar of, of the US or European uh, regulators. So I think, you know, it would be too risky for, for financial institutions, even for Chinese financial institutions to, to you know, to get engaged with, with, uh, with Russia uh, and help Russia to somehow to, um, you know, avoid these sanctions in, in order to prevent a, uh, the collapse of its economy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jana. I have a question uh, from my co-director that I see here. Uh, can any of the panelists comment, um, and it's about, um, I think, the entanglements of racism and nationalism. Can any of the panelists comment on the reports that African, Black, Ukrainian, and migrant populations are being refused or delayed transport out of Ukraine for the sake of prioritizing white Ukrainians and Europeans? And how does this relate to the frictions between different forms of nationalisms uh, in both Ukraine and and uh, the broader region. Do you know anything about this? I, I think it's a great question and I, I'm glad it will be addressed in a week in, in the panel. I have read about uh, the po Polish um, and Hungarian uh, border guards not letting African students from uh, you know, Kiev University through. I've also heard about racist attacks in Poland. Uh, I'm just, puzzled and shocked that Poland and Hungary, which have not allowed any African and Middle Eastern refugees in and have sent them into prisons and camps, are now allowing hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians in. I think this is, it's very important that they're letting them in, but why are they not letting, uh, you know, the others in who happen to be, um, you know, non-white? 
So yes, uh, that's a tricky question. Uh, and I'm glad there's a panel next week on that. Mm. Yeah, Ukraine, Ukraine's had some some problems before this with with, you know, um, violence or harassment of African students in, in Ukrainian universities. I wouldn't say that it's super widespread, but it's a lot more widespread than it it should be because it shouldn't it shouldn't happen at all. Um, and I've seen the reports about um, African students being refused um, exit. It's hard to know how prevalent it is, but again, it, it shouldn't happen at all. And I think the point that Georg raises is, is the right one, which is um, not only the differential treatments of these sort of white European refugees compared to refugees from um, Asia or Africa, but even the, I mean, I, I've been working on this conflict for, for, for 30 years, but in the broader, so I th I'm glad we're paying so much attention to this conflict. It's a catastrophe, but it is the case that pretty substantial catastrophes in other parts of the world um, have gotten a, a tiny fraction of the attention that we're giving this conflict. And so, and so we ought to think not about de-emphasizing this conflict, um, but looking more broadly at some of the conflicts that happen elsewhere around the world and, and doing as much uh, to try to um, reduce the impact of them as we can. Yeah. I just like to, you know, I agree with everything that was said, and I also read reports. I also read reports from uh, from the police uh, in all countries that, or most countries that receive refugees. Let's not forget that one million uh, Ukrainians left uh, their their land and that neighboring countries um, are welcoming them. And there is a lot of I come. From Slovakia, which is one of the countries that is accepting a lot of refugees, is a country of five million people, and has accepted nearly fifty thousand refugees. And 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 there is a lot of solidarity. So let's not forget that there is also a substantial effort um, and uh, this outpour of solidarity uh, to you know to help uh, those that that suffer. Um, and you know I I and you know I think we should deal. Uh, with the issues that uh, were raised, but I think the priority now is to just help people in, uh, and, and help people and uh, help them transition and, and, and survive uh, because they are suffering. Thank you, Jana. Just, just one more thing, yeah. Jeanette. There's, for, for people who are interested in, in following the details of this particular um, issue, Kimberly St. Julian Varnon is I, I recommend a, a, a Twitter follow uh, for her. She's a, a graduate student, a PhD student at Penn, and she has been doing a lot of work um, tracking exactly the, the progress of this of this question uh, in Ukraine over the last week or so. So Kimberly St. Julian Varnon um, is, I, I recommend that follow. Thank you, very important. Thank you, Kirill. Uh, we're approaching um, the end of today's webinar, and I think while we cannot look uh, into the future, let's hope for the best. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I'm wondering if the most likely scenario is that the, the Ukraine, like others before, become a, in the end a Russian vassal state and that the West and the rest of the world, um, if this war drags on long enough, will decide just to live with the Russian um, occupation and will be to a degree relief that it at least could be contained. Uh, but we don't know what's going to happen. History uh, will, uh, will teach us, will let us know. Um, I wanted um, to thank all of the uh, participants again for you know so spontaneously agreeing to come uh, and uh, join us here. We have many, many more questions. There are 61 um, in the Q&A. So if it's okay with all of you, um, uh, we will uh, share them with you um, so that you see what's, what's out there and can react if you don't mind. Um, and I wanted to thank all the attendees for coming here today and listening. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I hope that um, you know, we've all learned. I, I know that I have learned a lot. And to me, it always gives a little bit of solace to be together with others and speak about these things that are frightening and cause anxieties uh, in all of us, I guess. So thank you all for being here and creating this community and um, asking questions and answering questions. And I uh, hope you come see us again at the center, in particular for the event on uh, March 9th. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Bye-bye.